All right, so it's time to talk this letter written by TNA Talent or representatives from TNA Talent directed to Len Asper and Scott, excuse me, not Scott no more, but Anthem. I'm not going to read the entire letter. That would be absolute insanity for me to do that. Um, but we're going to get into this. Uh, a couple of things that stood out to me. I'm going I'm to read a couple paragraphs because I, I think they should be shared because it's what jumped out at me. I thought the overall vibe of this was, well, first of all, much more positive than what we've become accustomed to as TNA fans when there's drama and there's negativity and there's unpopular things happening behind the scenes. So um, it looks like the talent is, is prepared to give them a, a chance. What I got from this is that we're going to give you the opportunity to both fail and succeed. And when I say the opportunity to fail, that just means uh, we're not going to assume that you're going to fail. And then they're going to give them the opportunity, opportunity to succeed. But they also communicated to them um, that they didn't agree with what happened with, uh, you know, regarding Scott. And this is the uh, first part I want to read with you here. It states, it is our desire to have dialogue with you and with the company in an effort to protect. And uh, excuse me, I lost my place for a second. Let's start over. It is our desire to have a dialogue with you and with the company in an effort to protect the present and the future of TNA slash impact for you, for Anthem, for the fans and for professional wrestlers. We feel strongly that a quote wrestling person unquote needs to be intimately involved at a high level to ensure the amazing company we have built and products we've provided to our fans continues to grow and flourish. And then underlined said, is our, it is our opinion that the best possible person for that role was, is, and will be Scott. Here now and forever, right? So they're letting you know, um, we're in a very professional manner. We are not cool with a corporate stooge running things and who, who is not connected to the wrestling industry, you know, they say, well, he's got some experience with wrestling. Like, uh, so do I, cause I podcast and I cover it and I talk about it. Right. Um, the company, I mean, the wrestlers obviously feel Scott should be there. I don't think anyone there <laughs> wanted him out of power. We've talked about this many times. He's responsible for people coming and staying and resigning. He's given a lot of opportunity and maybe some of them are WWE retreads that we don't really care for, but his point is come here. I'm going to give you opportunity to prove people wrong, to reinvent yourself. Some people take advantage of it and some don't, but he was clearly very popular within everybody, but they're letting you know, like you might be running things, but we we expect to have an opportunity to be part of the process. You can't just come in here and change things. You know, we have in the military, we change commanders every two to three years. There's just a rotation. That's just how it is. And nine times out of nine, they come in and they just implement how things are going to go right off the bat. There's no like, hey, let me sit down with my my you know senior enlisted leaders and find out what's working what's not not working you know there's none of that there is we come in and we change shit and it's always and, lo, and morale is always very low because of it um and it's been like that since the beginning of time come in change shit morale low morale heightens guy leaves new person comes in and it's a it's a cycle So they're letting you know, like you, we, we don't want you just come in here and say, Hey, this is how it's going to be. We are the ones who have been here. We're the ones working hard to build what uh, this company has become. And we expect to have dialogue with you. Um, hopefully Anthem opens that door. It would be a very cowardice thing to do to not. I think it would be a huge mistake for them not to, but the wrestlers here are, going to give them every opportunity to succeed and every opportunity to fail. And I think that's the way 
you have to go into it. They made it a point to say, hey, we don't, we know that we don't know all the facts. Like we never know all the facts about anything in life. Any scenario that's out there, there's always two stories and then something in the middle. And we never know what something in the middle is because we just have to assume, we just have to, you know, take the facts, compile them together and, and come up with what we think it is. It's it's very rare that you just get, you get the whole truth about anything. And at least the wrestlers do recognize that, that we don't know the conversations behind the scenes. In many cases, they probably know just as much as we do, you know, (laughs) as far as like the dirt sheets stuff that has come out. Um, Another paragraph here, we we remain steadfast and hopeful that this letter can be the first step to opening and keeping open productive lines of communication to ensure the TNA Impact family continues to be a wonderful, unique place to work for many years to come. We ask and implore you to both come together and create a resolu- resolution that will re- reunite this family again. So when they're saying we implore you both to come together and create a resolution, they're letting you know there is a problem. It's not all sunshines and rainbows. They're letting you know there is a problem. We're being professional here, and we're saying we're giving you the opportunity but we're not okay with this. So you, you do have to fix it. We are your employees. You have to fix this. So I thought this was all done very, very well. I don't know who, how many people were involved here. I can't imagine the entire roster was sitting around doing this. It made me think of the movie, for those of you old enough, uh, Bring It On, where the uh, East Compton High Clovers were trying to ride into the uh, daytime talk show and they were all like sitting and, you know, coming up with this letter together and saying, they should call us inspiration leaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Write that. I, I don't think they were sitting around powwowing and coming up with this letter together. But clearly some of the people that they have um, acknowledged to be at the top, Frankie Kazarian and such, I'm sure was very much involved in this. This is their effort to try to get Scott back, I think, as well. I don't think it's going to work. We don't know that maybe Scott may come back at some point. Maybe maybe they will see that they made a mistake. I was watching an episode of Modern Family last night where uh, where uh, they opened up a parking lot and they were arguing over... Well, when I say they, it was Phil and, and Jay. They opened up a parking lot and they hired a parking lot attendant Jay didn't like him, said it, or didn't like her, saying she was way too friendly, uh, was wasting time, wasting people's times, and you know, basically was saying that anyone could do this. We just hire someone who just stands there and does the job. So they fire the parking lot attendant, and Jay steps in himself, and he can't manage the parking lot. You know, people drop off their keys with him when they leave. He didn't know whose keys went with with who, and it was a complete shit show. And then at the end, they had to hire the parking lot attendant back and she came in and got it back on track within seconds. And maybe that's going to happen. Maybe they're, you know, Anthem is going to say this didn't work. We try to bring this guy in. The stooge didn't work. And maybe we got to bring Scott in. Maybe that happens. Maybe Scott says, fuck you. and never returns. Who really knows? But again, the overall vibe was very positive and it's letting them know, Hey, we, we're not going anywhere. We're not punching out. We're not going to be disgruntled and negative because they know it starts from the top and they're not the top, but for us, they are because they're the wrestlers that we watch and we enjoy and we follow and we're going to follow their lead. And if they are going into this with an open mind, then I think as fans, we need to have an open mind as well because the letter many times is referencing the fans. It's just not talking about their well-being. It's talking about the fans. So I thought it was all done really well. Uh, but here's the here's the problem. Once that first domino falls, things could get ugly very, very quickly. But it depends on the size of the domino. Is the domino John Schuyler or is the domino Moose? But there's going to be a domino that falls at some point. There's no way that with everything going on here, that every single member of this talent roster is just going to you know, proceed forward. Somebody 
is going to want out. And then we're going to see how does Anthem handle this? You know, um, we got to remember there's a lot of people at the bottom of this roster not making a lot of money. They're making their indie rate. They don't have to be there. It's, you know, I'll, I'll use myself for an example as an Air Force reservist, okay? So I work my couple days a month. I could retire any day I want to. I'm well over my 20-year mark. But I like my supervisor. I like the people I work for. I like my commander. But if someone comes in and changes the game and I don't like it, I very easily could punch out. Now, what I get paid for two days, I get paid handsomely for two days. But at the end of the day, it's still two days pay. So if I were to go without that paycheck, my family is not going to be in a cardboard box, you know, camping out under an overhang. You understand what I'm saying? So my point is there's people on this roster that don't need the money because it's not really that life changing for them. And if someone comes in and this, this guy shows up in New Orleans and morale's down, there's people who are going to punch out. It's just a matter of time. So how are they going to handle this? How is Anthem Anthem going to handle it? How, you know, the dirt sheets are going to run with it. We just got to hope that the Dominoes are the John Schuylers, the Jason Hotches. And I'm not saying I want them to go. I like both those guys. I'm just saying it's in our best interest that if people do punch out, it's towards the bottom of the card. Because if they start losing people at the top, they're going to be in some very, very deep shit. What's interesting, too, with the information that's come out is I didn't realize Ed Norholm was still that involved and was part of, um, you know, part of things with Scott in, in their request for more funding and more budget. I had no clue. I was like, where the hell is Ed Norholm these days? And I guess he's gone now, too, um, as far as being involved in TNA, still still involved with Anthem. But I I had no clue. You know, um, I just haven't heard that name in so long. But it's it's good to know that Scott did have some backing and he wasn't, you know, fighting a battle all by himself. The disappointing part is it, it's clear that Anthem has no desire to really grow this company. For us as fans, it really sucks because we see the potential. We see the good and bad, but we see if they can do a little bit more of the good little more of the positivity, you know, maybe we can get to that next level. It's clear Anthem does not view TNA the way that Scott did. Scott wanted more out of it than Anthem envisioned themselves putting into it. They can say all the right things of, uh, you know, Anthony Shacconi coming in and he's going to do this and this and this. Why weren't they doing it before? If these guys, you know, if this guy's was, guy was part of Anthem, why, why weren't they before? What are you going to do now that different? That's going to grow the company that Scott wasn't trying to do. They're not the company. We have to, we have to come to the realization it is not going to grow the way we want it to. And now it's been uh, kind of reported that the production upgrades that we were excited for have not happened and probably aren't going to. And we didn't pick up on it right away because the first venue at the Palms, and you know, they had the new tunnel, the entrance ramp, you know, the smoother transition. So we're kind of like, all right, this does look better, right? And then they cut to Gia Miller for the first time backstage. It looks awful. And then as the next taping happens in Orlando, we're like, okay, we still like the graphics and the ropes and the tunnel, but this looks like Impact with the TNA logo. The more and more that the more episodes come out, we're starting to see, yo, this is just impact. The backstage stuff, this last episode was a little bit better. It's still bad. Clearly, uh, Anthem is not going to fix this. They're even offering these guys in production freaking jobs at Anthem. And I guess some of the wrestlers are going to do some of these shows on Anthem. Um, they're not geared towards the wrestling target demographic in any way whatsoever you know, hits from the eighties and shit like that. Yeah. I don't know if they're trying to get impact fans to watch these shows or 
hoping that the people who watch these shows are going to watch Impact, which would be ridiculous because it's completely outside of the Target demo. But as far as creative goes, it was initially reported that Tommy Dreamer was the head of creative. This, I believe, came from Meltzer. And then it was quickly rebuffed by Mike Johnson and uh, Sean Ross Sapp. But I think Mike Johnson was the one who got in on the information first. He has the best relationship with with TNA. These other guys, I don't think have a real relationship with them. I got into it. If you guys are familiar with JD from NY or whatever the the fuck he is on YouTube. I followed his channel for a little while. He's a big time AEW mark. Everything they do is good, but I think he's a good podcaster. So I still listen to it, even though. You know, I mean, I guess I'd listen to it more when I was really watching AEW. But even though I thought there was bad episodes of AEW, like this guy just seemed to like everything, which is fine. I mean, shit, at one point I probably liked everything with TNA when I first started doing this. But I kind of got into it with him on his podcast, on his YouTube channel, when he reported about Scott Demore. You can you can look it up. You can see our conversation. And I, I've left I've left a couple comments on other YouTubers as well. But for the life of me, I can't understand why a podcaster who doesn't watch TNA decides when this news comes out that they're going to report on it or they're going to give their opinions. And it's they try to say, well, it, because it's has to do with the overall landscape of wrestling. Like, have you ever seen me on this channel? I've had this channel for 10 years, I think, or pretty close to. Have I ever weighed in on my thoughts on what WWE was doing as far as, you know, if I did, if it it had to do with releases, I might get into it because I'm like, hey, who's a fit for impact? But you don't see me getting on here talking about the Vince McMahon scandal, about when Triple H is in power, you know, about the the SmackDown and Raw drafts and about The Rock. I'm not getting in here talking about that because it's not my place because I don't watch the fucking product. But all these bigger podcasters coming out the woodworks with their thoughts on Scott Demore. And JD said on his, I don't watch TNA and I'm definitely not going to now. So that's what pushed you over the edge, their treatment of Scott Demore. It's bullshit like that that just really freaking angers me because there's a lot worse going on in AEW and in WWE, but people keep fucking chugging along. But because <laughs> they got Scott Demore's back all of a sudden, I I, I can't watch TNA. The, the justifications that people come up with are absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, it was reported by Meltzer, who, again, I don't think has any great contacts within the company because he's been wrong a lot lately. Was that Tommy Dreamer's ahead of creative? I would have been okay with Dreamer's ahead of creative. I don't have a problem with him being involved in the company. I don't like him in my fucking main event. I don't like him wrestling for titles. And I think I, I speak for a lot of people. But I listen to Busted Open Radio. He's a great wrestling mind. He really is. My only concern is that recently he talked about how good this episode of AEW was. I'm like, that show's not good. I'm not saying it's like 100% bad, but for the most part, they're not very good. And I just feel like your finger's not quite on the pulse the way it should be of what good wrestling is. If you watch, sit through two hours, you're like, yo, this was a great episode. Even when I watched AEW from week to week. I was never like, this was a great episode. There's great segments and great matches, but it's never, there's never a good episode from top to bottom. So that kind of like concerned me a little bit because <laughs> I always say, I always thought he had a really, really good mind, but every time he speaks on busted open, I, I tend to agree with what he says uh, regarding wrestling in general. So he's someone I'm okay with. And if he, if he was the head of creative, I probably would have been okay. Okay, with it, there is no real creative right now. The storylines are Macklin and um, Nick Nemeth, freaking AJ Francis and Rich Swan with what they got going on, and uh, Giselle Shaw firing the uh, the Shantaraj. Like maybe I'm leaving one or two things out, like the Good Hands and Ali. I don't know, but there's there's no real stories going on here. So you know. I'm not even really tripping about creative, but they're bringing in Ariel Shearner. 
he was the Dr. Ariel on screen before this is well before Dr. Ross. He was on screen for went back when Don Callis was around for maybe three or four episodes. His character was horrible. And it, it, at least with the Dr. Ross segments, he's like involved with injuries. And this dude was just, this goof was just walking around backstage. I remember one episode, they're like, who are you? He's like, I'm a doctor. Like that was his only line. And it was so phony. I don't know what this company's obsession is with phony doctors. Uh, uh, but he was a horrible on screen character. He had minimal lines. He was walking around in a freaking lab coat like Dr. Ross like they do with him looking like a goof. Like, I mean, he was really on three or four episodes and I was like, get this guy off my screen. This this is awful. Again, at least they would like factor Dr. Ross into the (laughs) storylines somewhat. This guy was just walking around like a goof for the lab coat, giving nothing to the product. And he's the head of creative. I was like, oh shit. Granted, I know nothing about the dude, but, um, I'm I'm not like super optimistic. I'm trying not to be like over overly negative about it. I'm not super optimistic that this guy and Anthony Ciccone is just <laughs> or the guys for the job. The company is letting you know, letting them know we need a wrestling person at the top. And these are not do not appear to be wrestling people. So just like I said after they're hard to kill, we're gonna know what TNA is during the the first set of tapings, which is right now Orlando. And it's been clear that it's impact with some tweaks, but there's some fresh matches. The shows are better. The shows are better. Let me not paint a picture that I think they suck. I don't, but it's impact with some different colors and logos, especially the backstage stuff is impact 100%. So just like I said that with the Orlando tapings, these New Orleans ones, when they when they're on screen, that's what we're gonna know. How, how we're gonna have an idea how this is gonna go, because there's gonna report be reports coming about coming out about this and this happening backstage. We're gonna see what the energy is of the talent. We're gonna see what kind of matches they put together, what the booking is. You know, so we really got to give this set of tapings our full attention. And then at the end, say, okay, are we going to move? Are we moving in a good direction or, or not? Obviously, they're going to carry over a lot of Scott's ideas. You know, they're not just going to start from scratch here, but we're going to know. We're going to have a good idea uh, the direction we're going by the New Orleans tapings. So we'll see how they come out. 